the development of the story is a bit more into learning something and trying to explore it on a larger scope. Learning that there's somebody you can talk to, that there are people, a lot of people really, who have gone through a lot of these particular troubles and they're living with them. Now, you want to try and go into their lives and try to see how do they live with these troubles, what, how do they sleep, how do they wake up and all that. So that was the inspiration from my friend to knowing a, a few other people who have gone through the experiences to wanting to tell their stories. My name is Douglas Logedi Luhangala. I am a businessman. I run an educational consultancy business called Know Your Studies. Know Your Studies is basically a platform that gives our students a chance to access materials, to improve their skills, soft skills, um, to learn more about the job market. So I'm helping students from universities to be able to get more about the market and just also learn more about themselves. I'm also a farmer. I rear and sell chicken um, back in the village. Not many people know about that. It's just a, a side business. And then I'm the author of this very beautiful book uh, Chasing a Bullet. Now Chasing a Bullet is a crime thriller. A crime thriller uh, centered around terrorism and how it's planned, how it's executed, the victims, the perpetrators, the planning process and everything around it, basically around East Africa and uh, the African region at large. I chose terrorism because the story about this book is quite personal to me. In 2015, um, you'll remember about the Garissa University attack. Now, one of the people who uh, died in that attack was a mentee of mine. He's called Karani Chagwe. And he's a young man I had mentored from a very young age, and I really had a lot of hopes in him. He was killed uh, by a bullet in that particular attack, and from what we had, he was among the very last people to be killed. There were quite a lot of bullet wounds on his body, and I had the trouble of being the person to identify the body. And that, that image really stayed in my head. So I decided, um, I wasn't the kind of person who would go to counseling, so I decided to seek my own closure. And my, my type of closure was, I was going to write something, that I'm going to immortalize this young man, and I'm going to be remembering him through it. So I wrote a story, a very short story. It was about 2,500 words. And from that story then, when, when I was writing that story, another terrorism event happened. It was just a small grenade attack and I realized these things are happening over and over. So what do I do? I can be able to put this into a complete novel. So somewhere around July 2015, I decided that I'm going to put this into a very complete um, novel. So I decided I'm going to research about it, I'm going to collect information, find authentic information that I can be able to tell people about terrorism and crime planning in general. So I decided to start collecting data and start putting together this book just as a tribute to my friend and also as a way of showing the world what is happening from the perspective of somebody who lives in it. The research process was a bit scary and, and extensive. As I said, I wanted to give an authentic story. So one of the things I realized quickly that I have to do is be able to speak to people who have lived in this moment. People who have lived in the terrorist, uh, terrorist moment, people who have lived in the organized crime scenes, and people who have experienced it from both a, a perpetrator and a victim point of view. So the first point of research, if you are doing any book of this sort, is to go to where it's planned. So I decided to travel to Mogadishu in 2015. I didn't tell anybody I was going there, but when I arrived, I. I to look for some people who are working uh, there, part of the KDF, and they could escort me around the town. They are my friends. So I went to Mogadishu, I spoke to people who have seen uh, young people recruited into the Al Shabaab. Some people who work there, they just look at it like a normal job, just like you are a security guard in Nairobi. Some people who do that. I spoke to people who have been recruited and defected from it. I spoke to people who have been recruited and stay there, they are afraid to defect and things like that. So I spoke to a lot of people to just try and gather as, as much authentic information as I can. When I came back from um, Mogadishu, I, I felt a new uh, kind of fire to write this story because some, for these people really, look at a situation whereby for these people, uh, the sound of a gun is the order of the day. So when there are no bullets firing, these people be, uh, start panicking. I talked to somebody and I was asking them, why are you panicking because there's nobody shooting? And they were saying that at least when they're shooting, you know where the bullets are coming from. When they're not shooting, we panic because we know there'll be bullets, so we don't know where they're coming from. So living in that environment for 10 days was one of the scariest uh, moments of my life because I, I, every morning you wake up thinking, this is the day I'll die. 
but then after 10 days I was back um, to the country. That time um, Somalia was a bit really um, blown up. I came back and I collected the information that I had but then I quickly realized if I'm going to look at terrorism in Kenya I'm having to go to Mombasa because that's where it starts at the coast. So I also traveled to the coast. I spoke to some people um, who go to some of uh, the, 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 the notorious mosques, the Majengo mosque that we hear about and, and I spoke to people who have uh, there have been attempts to recruit them. I spoke to somebody whose uh, father was uh, killed, uh, suspected to have been recruiting people. And a lot of information that you find in this book is a collection of those stories. And then I came back to Nairobi and I decided to look at people who have been in real um, terrorist events. So I spoke to people who have been in, in, in the Westgate event. I spoke to about seven of them. I spoke to some people who um, were affected by the bomb blasts, uh, the, the, the bombs from the past. Some people were working in the government when the Norfolk uh, was attacked. Some people were working when um, we had the very first blast at the OTC in Kenya. Um, some people who were part and in the building when the American embassy was um, blown up. And I was trying to find out how do they live with these stories. There's a woman who was part of the Westgate attack whom I spoke to and she has not even read this book. She promised me that she'll never read it because she doesn't want to relive that story. She lost her hip in that, in that attack. She's on a wheelchair. She doesn't have a problem um, sitting on a wheelchair the whole of her life, but she can't just stand crowds, you know. So such people are part of the people whose stories I try to tell in this book through fiction, but then by trying to tell their story as authentically as I can. So I would say the research was um, extensive, scary in a way. Um, I listened to a lot, of, a lot of things. I watched a lot of things. I've had to watch videos from massacres from the 1980s, the 1990s. I've had to listen to documentaries from the terrorism in the Horn of Africa, terrorism in West Africa. And I've had to listen to what really drives the mind of these people because I really want our society to be able to understand that if somebody is going into this is there a way back? Can we help this person back? Or how can you then live with these people uh, when they're integrated back in the society? Because that's one of the biggest problems, the, the, the mental health aspect, the, the closure aspect, because people who are in these events really don't get to recover. So that was part of what inspired my research and what just drove me to try and look at the information from a deeper point of view. Um, that experience has changed me a lot as a human being. That's, that's a softer landing spot for me because then as a human being when you speak to people who are uh, you know struggling with the issue of terrorism stereotypes for example a lot of people from the coast young people especially are stereotyped a lot um, some people who have been victims in these attacks for example the West get attack which was one of the most troubling ones, there are people who lived through that experience. Then Peketoni attack, there are people who lived through that whole night of experience. So you learn to empathize with people. I've learned to empathize with people because you just don't know what happened in that moment. You just don't know what this person saw. Because if you saw somebody being slaughtered, this changes your life forever. You don't know what went through that process. So I've learned to empathize. I've learned to listen. Because some people, the only closure they want is somebody to talk to. So I've learned to listen without judging and asking questions. Because a lot of us want to ask questions. How was it? Ah, what did you do? Some, some of these people don't want that question. They just want to, you to sit there and listen. They just want to talk. And they feel a lot better when they have talked. So I've learned to listen, I've just learned to be human and I've learned to offer that particular soft spot for, if you, if you may, for these people to tell their stories. As a writer, it's taught me to look way below the surface because if you just look at things from the superficial point of view, you don't get to understand uh, the details of it. So as a writer, I've learned to look at things deeper. I've learned to ask questions. I I'm more like a philosopher in my writing because I don't look at everything and say, okay, I ask why, when, where, could it have been different? And things like that. That's what it taught me because, because it taught me that a lot of people just want to see you express, uh, express a little bit more concern and they'll tell you more. So as a writer, it's taught me to look for more information and it's also taught me that a lot of authentic information exists if you look for it. Because the story of putting this book together has enabled me to travel to places I didn't think I would and it's given me a bigger, better perspective of what, what goes on in those worlds and their heads.
I've been with Rachel's Guild for over five years now, and since it started, since it was very young, and I came in just to help with my human mobilization element. I wasn't a writer at that point. I didn't consider myself a writer when I joined Writers Guild. I just came in to help uh, Gabriel, who is my friend. Now, um, I've seen Writers Guild grow. Writers Guild was a club that had hardly 10 members when it was starting. I could I knew all the members by off head. I think only three of them were writers at the point. And then it's grown. We got in more writers. We started with cocktail parties. First of all, it was just a club. Then we went to cocktail parties. Then we went to doing magazines for ourselves, just, you know, for fun, to just put ourselves out there. Then we went to doing corporate magazines. Then before we knew it, we had a small office. And then we started getting into editing people's books without going into the publishing process. Then slowly by slowly, now we are way way deep into the publishing and i look at i look forward to a time when now writers guild is going to be a big publishing house because that's where it's going uh, in the future i've seen a lot of young writers come through writers guild some experience actually come through some successfully some not and it's all about the attitude and the perception that they come in with and a lot of the young people have a lot of things to learn from uh, some of these experienced people especially from an expectation point of view My advice to young writers is first of all, just write, okay? Don't worry about perfection. Don't worry about having the perfect book out there. Don't even write a book. You are not writing a book, you are writing a story. You just write a story. When you've written a story, you'll give it to people. Writers Guild has developmental editors and other people who can now transform your story into a book. So first of all, just write. But as you write, Focus a bit on quality, read a bit, you know, read to find out whether what you are writing is readable because a lot of times you'll just write a story and you are writing this story, you are the only person who can read it and maybe your girlfriend or boyfriend. But then you should write a story that some people can read. So if you read somebody else's story, you'll come back to your story and think, by the way, my story is not good enough and you can change one or two things. That doesn't mean your story is trash. It means you just have to change one or two things and your story can be good uh, again. My other advice to them is patience stop rushing to get a book out you know take it slowly take it step by step take your time because if you take your time and produce the best quality you, you won't have to redo it you won't have the stress of noticing a spelling mistake on the last day so be uh, patient take your time and get the best people to work on with you because then if you are working with people who understand you better then they know how to correct you they know how to give you feedback they know what is your, 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 your limit so i would encourage them to one right Two, write quality. Three, read. And four, um, get the right people to work with and have a, a little bit of patience. Also know that you need to invest yourself in it in terms of marketing, in terms of getting people to buy your book, in terms of research, you need to invest yourself. It's, it's a business, it's a business. So treat it as a business, know that you are writing for a customer base and you'll really be successful in that.